I'm sorry. They had something really great planned and uh, it didn't work well, it out. So like now you're stuck. Sound like you had the great plan come through. Do what? Sound like the great plans came through. Well, the, the grandbaby? That came through just fine. That was a grand plan. <laughs> yeah, we praise, we praise God. It was, yeah. Thank you for praying. We do praise God for that. So, uh, what else do we want to thank God for? I thank God for crickets. I can hear them right now. No. No, really, what, what's something that you would just like to thank the Lord for? For a beautiful day. Beautiful day. It really it was, wasn't it? Yeah. It rained today. Did it rain? It did. It didn't rain where we were. Oh, it rained. But I noticed we can speak to the couple in front of our house, so I haven't wondered yet. But I thought, it was, I thought maybe it was still from yesterday. So. Yeah. But, okay. Twofold, yes, praise God. Thank God for the answer to prayer there, right? Yeah, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My blood pressure just shoots up. Well, it didn't shoot up at the, that particular time, did right. it? So you got to have that taken care of. Yeah, praise God for that. <laughs> okay, so we'll go ahead and pray. And uh, we just uh, ask God to bless our time together and, and to help us to figure out the technical issues that we've been apparently... Uh, Covering and uh, we'll just uh, let God work. Okay, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your love. And we thank you, Lord God, for your presence, Lord. We thank you, Father, that your love translates into meaningful movement, Lord, in our lives, Lord, as you lead us and as you coax us, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to follow you and to know you, Lord, to encounter you, Lord, in your word. And Father, we just thank you that in your faithfulness to us, Lord, that um, you continue the work, Lord, even when we're feeling stubborn and, and selfish, Lord, you you pursue us and you do the work that we need in our lives, Lord. And uh, we just praise you because your work is transformative. It breaks chains. It teaches us, Lord, about your character, about your love, your power, Lord, your holiness and our need for you. And so, Father, we praise you and, and ask, Lord God, that you would move in the requests that were mentioned tonight physical things, Lord, and, and the emotional and the spiritual things, Lord, we, we recognize, Lord, that as each of the requests have been made, Father, that there are, these reflect struggles, Lord. Uh, in many cases, Lord, these are, these are just trying to overcome problems and, and, and various afflictions. And, and in some cases, Father, these are, uh, these are situations, Lord, where faith is even challenged, Lord, and people um, are, they struggle, Lord, with their understanding of you and and what it means, Lord, uh, for them to be loved by you, Father. And we pray, Lord God, that as you move in these lives, moves in, move in these situations, Lord, that you would help, Lord, the, uh, the, uh, the heart that is struggling, Lord, to, to believe your promises, Lord, to seek you, Lord, and to allow you, Lord God, to have your way in their life, Lord. And, Lord, uh, we thank you for the many praises that were shared as well. We thank you, Lord, for safety. We thank you, Lord God, for your protection, Lord, for your awesome power, Lord, as you have been working in our lives, our individual lives, but our families, Lord, and in our church. And so, Lord God, we just give you glory, Lord, and we praise you because, Lord, you are worthy, you are beautiful, you are great, you are awesome, Lord. And, Lord, your majesty, Lord, there is no one like you. And, and Lord, we thank you that through Jesus Christ, Lord, we can come, Lord, to you and know you and walk with you and be set free by you. And, uh, Lord, we just praise you for that. We pray, Lord, as we open the book of Galatians this evening in your word, that you'll just challenge us, Lord, and encourage us and help us, Lord, to, to allow your Holy Spirit to deal with us and to work in us with your great and perfect plan. And thank you for each soul here, Lord. I thank you for, Lord, how you have worked in them and, and for those, Lord, who are ready to just jump in and to to lead, Father, in, in my absence, Lord, I just thank you for these uh, these servants of Jesus, Lord, and I pray you'll bless them and their families as well. We love you, Lord God, and uh, we're glad to be here tonight. We pray in Jesus' name.
So um, the, I guess um, the, what we're going to do is start with the book of Galatians as we talked about. The book of Galatians was a letter written by Paul. It was written probably about 50 AD and was written to a number of churches, not just one church in one city, unlike some of the letters he's written, some of the letters he had written were written to specific congregations in a particular city. The book of Galatians is actually more like a regional letter, and, and so it's addressing um, congregations in the general area of Galatia. In Paul's first missionary journey, he probably, we believe that he passed through the southern part of Galatia, and then in the second and third um, journey that Paul took to share the gospel of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, he passed through the more northern part of Galatia. And so um, this probably happened before uh, the, um, there's a, there was a council in Jerusalem that took place that kind of reviewed, that Acts refers to, uh, that took place to kind of affirm the freedom that we have in Christ when there was a lot of question about whether or not um, you had to become more or less a Jew to really be a Christian. And that council was formally um, taken on and, and, and so forth. But even before that council took place, <clears throat> Paul, um, as now an apostle of Jesus, has addressed the issue that that council would later address. And uh, that is the, uh, the false teaching, the false idea that you and I have to take on a, 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 religious, um, a, a, a religious practice. And, you have, and we have to do ritualistic things in order to be... Uh, Christians now um, to be saved specifically, and um, so he addresses that and uh, he tackles it. And the tone of his letter to the Galatians is a little different. You'll notice if you compare it to the opening of Ephesians and Philippians and so forth, you'll notice that there's a little bit of a difference in the way he opens. He's a little sterner or tougher in his address in the book of Galatians than he is in Philippians and Ephesians, where he will say to the people that he's writing to, hey, you know, I'm just so thankful for what God's doing, and you're doing really good on this, or that, or the other thing, I've been encouraged by what I hear about what God's been doing in your lives, et cetera, et cetera. He doesn't really do that in Galatia. He gets right to the punch. And uh, because um, Christianity at this particular point in its history is, a, is at a fragile spot. And what I mean is, is that um, the, all the scriptures were being written about this time, and they are being compiled. The eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life and his ministry, his teachings, the eyewitnesses of his crucifixion and then his resurrection. Those things are being written at this particular time. And so they didn't have the finished New Testament the way that we have. And so there really weren't a lot of guiding things at that point, because right today we can look at the Bible and say, you know, when you say this, or when you do that, or when you require this, uh, you're really departing from the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus. And this is concerning. You're adding to it, or you're taking away, or you're twisting it in some way, so that it is something that it really isn't supposed to be. And so uh, he recognizes the fragility of, the, of these babes in Christ, so to speak, and writes to them these things so that they can get this and keep this on track. What God has begun to do in them, he wants to protect by saying, listen, you need to go back to the simplicity of the gospel that is this, that, they're, that we're saved simply by faith in Jesus. And that is generally, I think, the overall theme and, and purpose of the book of Galatians. Of the Galatians. Um, and so as we read it, uh, we will do what I think we try to do always, and that is to understand how the principles that are being addressed here apply to the things, the challenges, and the issues that we face today. And we try to recognize in, the, in uh, our context, in our lives, in our culture, uh, in our church, and in Christianity in general, how the issues that, he, that the Bible is de dealing with as we're reading these things that the issues that took place then are the issues that we still can find ourselves falling into. Okay? Uh, because we're just, if we, if we depart from the basic teaching of the scriptures, then we are very vulnerable to falling into the same traps uh, that other people have 
throughout history, and that is that we get away from Jesus. We get away from what it really means to be saved. We get away from that, that life-changing, life-giving message of the gospel. That is, that Jesus died on the cross for our sin, that Jesus rose from the dead, and that it is only by faith that we are saved. Okay? It's not that we do anything. It's not that we prove anything. Everything that we do and everything that we um, commit, our still, commit ourselves to physically as Christians should be the outflow of what has already been done in us. If we are saved, then our lives do change because we're saved. We don't prove anything. We don't earn our salvation. And so when we read the book of Galatians, we're going to really see how uh, Paul um, addresses the regression uh, of the people who are receiving his letter into the old idea, the, Jew, the, the uh, Jewish idea, that, um, that you have to keep the law to be saved. Okay, we're going to address that in more detail as we go through this. Okay, so um, uh, just so you know, in the first chapter of Galatians, he kind of sets the stage, uh, and, and he begins by um, talking to them about the, the reason for his writing, and that um, um, he, as he writes to them, has the authority to talk to them about what he's talking to them about, if that makes sense. He has every right to talk to them, and he knows what he's talking about, and so they need to pay attention to him as he shares with them uh, the need and the call to return to the simple gospel of Jesus. So, um, I'd like for us to go ahead and read, um, we'll just read through the chapter, and then we're going to break it down. Would somebody read, like to read verses 1 through 5 to begin with? Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from his present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forevermore. Amen. Okay. Okay, so um, Paul begins this particular letter the way that he, write, he begins most of his letters, and that is Paul the Apostle sent from God, you know, um, and to whoever he's writing to, right? So... Um, what do you notice? What what is verse one as Paul begins this letter to the Galatians? And remember, this is a personal letter. And just so you know, um, as he's writing it, writing it, he's not writing it in any fancy way. He's using everyday language for them at that time. He's using everyday language. He, he's just writing a letter like you and I. Would. He writes to them, and and it, he's using. The kind of vernacular they would have used, he would have used the kind of slang that they would have understood, and so forth and so on. Um, it's it's a letter. It's not it's not a journal. It's not a, uh, a a formal discourse. He's not writing above people's heads. He's writing, and he could because Paul is a very academic person. He grew up as a very he grew up he heavily educated. Um, on a number of levels. He was a Hellenistic Jew in the sense that uh, he um, was acquainted very thoroughly with Greek culture and understood the writings and so forth. He refers to them in his, uh, what's called the uh, um, Sermon on Mars Hill in the book of Acts. Uh, he's also educated deeply in the sense that he is a very devout Jew, a very devout Pharisee, he has learned under Gamaliel, one of the one of the most well-known teachers of the Jewish law. He was one of his students, and he he knows stuff. And he could, if he wanted to, write, uh, you know, on, you know, and, and maybe sometimes he was a little highbrow for some folks. But his his intent though was to write in a way that everybody he's writing to understands. You know, he's writing to them as 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 thoroughly and as genuinely as he possibly can so that they get to, they, they hear what simple message he wants to convey to them. So he, he's an apostle. What do you think, what does it mean to you, this idea that he's an apostle? When we think of an apostle, what do we, what do we mean by that? An eyewitness to God. 
Okay, and this, and, there, and that is an important point, that he was an eyewitness to God in a way that was different than the other disciples. How, was he, how were the other disciples apostles? And when we talk about the apostles, who, for example, are we talking about? Because not everybody's an apostle. Peter, John. Peter, John, James, and so on, right? Right, they were the 12, right? And Judas was excluded because he, eventually, because he betrayed Jesus. But there were still the others, right? And so they are apostles. They were to be that inner circle of followers of Jesus. And they were commissioned by Jesus, particularly chosen by Jesus, to be, learn from him and to then become his primary instruments in conveying the gospel. After Jesus was crucified, after Jesus was resurrected, and after Jesus ascended and left them, and the Holy Spirit came, they were the leaders of the church, and they were able to take into that the authority of having actually seen Jesus, heard Jesus, <coughs> and personally chosen by Jesus, and, and they are his representatives in that way. But Paul is a little different. How is Paul allowed to be an apostle in the way that they were apostles? Oh, Jesus, Jesus came to Paul personally. Right. Right. Do you recall that Paul was a persecutor in the Acts and tells us he was a persecutor of the church? He was running around. He got letters from the council. He was looking for... Uh, belief, uh, Jewish people who had converted or who had become, I'd rather say it this way, they had become followers of Jesus. And uh, he was trying to get them in jail, thrown in jail. He was present when Stephen was stoned, one of the deacons, one of the seven chosen as a deacon. Um, so, you know, uh, he, he thought he was serving God, right, by persecuting Christians because he thought Christians were wrong. And then, as he's on another trip to get more people thrown in jail because they follow Jesus, on the road to Damascus, he was encountered by Jesus, right? Jesus revealed himself to him and spoke directly to him. Uh, do you remember that, whatever, do you recall what Jesus said to him? Why do you persecute me? Yeah. Why are you, why are you persecuting me? And at the time, of course, he hadn't. Saul slash Paul didn't understand what that meant, but he cert certainly learned. Uh, when he was persecuting Christians, he was persecuting Christ. When he was chasing down Christians, he was opposed to the work and the presence and the life of Jesus. And then he met Jesus, and his life was changed by Jesus. <clears throat> so he became a follower of Jesus, and he was... And he was commissioned by Jesus, too. I'm going to show you one of the things Jesus said to him in that particular encounter was, I'm going to show you all the things that you're going to suffer for me. But he's going to send him, in, send him to the Gentiles. So he's commissioned by Jesus. He's chosen by Jesus. And he's, a, he's, he's met with Jesus. All right. So he, in this sense, he's an apostle because he's heard and met Jesus. He was chosen by Jesus. And he's given authorization by Jesus himself to serve him and to proclaim the gospel of Jesus. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so he is an apostle, and he's not, he's, he, what do you think he says? He pulls that card out, you know, he's introducing himself to the, the uh, Galatians. He says, this is from Paul, an apostle. Do you think he's bragging? So why, I mean, I, you know, if I'm going around saying, well, I was especially chosen by Jesus, you know, if I say that, you know, that would be a brag, right? And there are people who do that, aren't there? There are people who will say, well, God chose me to do this and that, and you need to listen to me and do what I say, right? Or am I wrong? I've heard that before. Okay, right. I have too. But Paul really was. And so he's not bragging. The fact that he mentions it is simply so they understand Part of, there are a couple of things. One is that they understand that he has um, been eyewitness to things that they need to pay attention to. And then secondly, with that comes an authority that they need to recognize. Not that he's going to lord it over them, but here they're deviating, and, they, and here he's intervening. If he's just anybody trying to tell him what he thinks, who cares? But if he's an apostle chosen by Jesus and sanctioned by Jesus to be a messenger to them to intervene where they're deviating, then they need to pay attention. Maybe he's also telling them so that they're not scared of him. Maybe so. Because you prosecute them, you know. 
And yeah, yeah. Do with those maybe so that maybe he's yeah maybe he's a changed man. Right. Yeah, I'm sure there were some who were still a little suspicious of yeah. Paul because we know that after he was converted, there were a lot of people at first who were just scared to death of him. Yeah. Uh, even the other apostles were a little nervous around him, right? Until Barthol or. Uh, um, Do what? Barnabas. Barnabas. I want the same Barnabas. Barnabas, right. Son of encouragement. I was getting tongue tied. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, Barnabas had to intervene and actually say, hey, my man Saul here, he's a follower of Jesus now. And he, he really, you know, and and the apostles then felt better about it. So, yes, yeah, right, point taken. You know, maybe they were a little nervous. And um, the fact, though, that he begins with an apostle. But then he says, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. So why do you think he says that? Not from men, nor through man. Because when you live in sin, you're dying. True, that's true. And once you're saved, you're not. That's right. It's because his authority didn't come from people, it came directly from God. That's true, that's right. His authority wasn't given to him. He wasn't, um, this isn't just a rubber stamp position that other people gave to him. You know, unlike his role when he was still working with the Pharisees, okay, where did his authority as a Pharisee come when he got letters obtained from the council to go and persecute Christians? Did it come from God? Yeah. No, it came from men, right? Mm -hmm. An institution of men, which was the council. Uh, so, this, he says, this is different now. I'm not who it was. I'm not coming to you like I used to. I'm coming to you now because God has actually spoken to me. And I'm concerned for you. And you need to listen. Listen to me. Because you're in dangerous waters. But he has come through Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers who were with me. Why do you think he says that? He, he speaks of Jesus. He speaks of God. And then he speaks of the brothers and sisters. Who are with me? Who is, he, who is he referring to? The other apostles. Right, because now they recognize his role and his and his legitimate calling. You know, they can ask the other apostles, is, is Paul one of us now? Yeah, he is. And he knows, he knows what he's talking about. Okay. And so, and then he, you know, uh, from Paul to the churches of Galatia at the end of verse 2. And then he... Uh, in verse 3, in verse 4, in verse 5. Verse 3, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. He does a lot of that in his other letters too. In verse 4 and verse 5, he kind of sets his theological position right at the outset. And it's through the lens of what he says in verses 4 and 5 that everything else is going to come to them. So what does he say in verse 4? What are some important nuggets? What's the first one? He's talking about Jesus. That gave himself he for gave, our sins. Right. He gave, trying to bring him up to the new stuff and forget the old laws. Right. He, yeah, it's Jesus who gave himself, right? He's, he's, his, 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 his foundation for everything that he says is this. Jesus gave himself for our sins. Right? <laughs> Okay, and there's a lot to that. Who's Jesus? Well, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. He's the anointed one. He's the one who was sinless. But he gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for our sins, not his sin. He was crucified for whose sin? Not his sin. Why? Because he was sinless. He was sinless. There is no sin in Jesus who gave himself for our sins. He gave himself? Or was it forced upon him? This is important too. Did anybody murder Jesus? Yeah. There is a sense you can say that in the sense that people who hated him had murder in their hearts. But he sacrificed himself for us. Yeah, and, and, and but no one could take his life unless he wanted it. Right. Yeah, he gave himself for us. So, and Jesus even made that remark to the disciples. He said, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord. I lay it down of my own accord. My choosing, my initiative, it is my plan, my will to lay my life down. And he does. 
He laid his life. He gave himself for us. Nobody took Jesus and made him be our sacrifice, unless you could say that you could say that of the Father, I suppose. But it was an agreement with the Son. It was the will of the Father, and it, with the agreement of the Son, who laid himself down for us. He gave himself for our sin. Our sin. So what is our sin? What does it mean by our sin? Anything that keeps us from God. Anything that keeps us from God. Yeah. Our rebellion against God, right? And all the little things, I say the little things, they're not little things, they're big things, they're horrible things, they're terrible things. We just don't think of them that way because we're so used to them. Have you ever gotten so used to a sound that you stop realizing that it was there? I lived in one place growing up, and um, there was a train track. When we first moved there, every single night at 2 a.m., a train would come through there. And it would come through fast, and it would make such a hum. It wasn't even a clickety-clack. It was a hum that was going through so fast. And uh, eventually, after a while, I, I stopped noticing it. Have you ha ever had a smell that you got so used to, you don't notice it anymore. I'm sure you have. Yeah. You may be in a particular place, and a place you work, maybe, or a place you've lived, or a place that you grew up, a particular house, a particular room, or something, and it was always there. And after a while, maybe you noticed it first, but after a while, you stopped noticing it. And if somebody came to visit it, and they said, I smell something, what is that? You go, what? I, I, I don't smell anything. Why? Because you become used to it. You become, you become desensitized to it. Do you know sins like that? We don't think about it. It doesn't look like sin to us. Why? Because maybe it's not that we're doing a, doing a particular thing, but it's because it's so common, it's so normal, that we don't notice it anymore. We become desensitized to sin. So a lot of things that we may think are little things or little sins may still be, they will still be grievous to God. Because they're radical departures from God's attitude, God's love, God's holiness. So I may think, well, I'm not breaking the law. Can you still sin and not break the law? Yes. You absolutely can. A lot of our greatest sins are legal. Just because something is legalized or approved by society in maybe a less formal way does not mean that it's any less grievous to God. No, like you're right. We know through the Bible and, and, and the record that it keeps for us for the, the people of the Old Testament, the nations and so forth, things can be institutionalized in such a way that everybody thinks, this is okay, this is okay, this is okay. And it happens today, too. But Jesus died for our sin. And our sins are so terrible and so grievous to God. They're so ugly. They're so stinky. They're so noisy. They're so, so ugly <coughs> to God that it took the Son of God to die for us because those things separated us. But Jesus gave himself for us, for our sins, to deliver us from the present evil age, it says. present evil age. What do you think it means to deliver us from this present evil age? To save us. To save us. And what does that mean? Some people think that, well, Jesus, if he came to deliver you, it's that his intent is to set you free from the presence of something. We have to be careful with that because sometimes um, Things that Jesus saved us from continue to be part of our world, even in our families. There can still be a brokenness. Uh, there can even be fleshly impulses that we may not necessarily find immediately taken away from us, but he came to deliver us. What's he talking about? Deliver us from what? Our sin. What does that mean? Our separation from him. Well, it means... It, right. Okay. Right. Our separation, the conquer the separation that we have because of our sin. Because what does the blood of Jesus do for us? We know from the Old Testament, we read Hebrews, we read uh, where, Jesus, where the scriptures tell us uh, that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no removal of sin. So we know that 
in his dying for us, in his shedding of blood for us, that that sin applied, or that blood applied to our sin takes away its power to separate us from God. But then what else? Does that mean that we're just forgiven and we have, we're still doomed to continue in our sin? We have to be careful of that too. Well, we are forgiven, but he doesn't want us to keep repeating. Right, that's good, right. Yeah, what does Peter tell us? He says that God's divine power has given us everything we need for life, that means to live, and for godliness, through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. So, the godliness, that means we take on the aspects of godness. Love. Regard for others. Holiness. You know, we begin to dislike sin. Why? Because we've been delivered from sin. He's rewiring us. He's changing us in our nature as the power of God fills us through his truth. So he came to deliver us from the present evil age. And the evil age that he's talking about isn't just that particular era in history. He's talking about this state that our world still is in. For sin seems to be in control and people are still not wanting to follow God and here we are maybe a minority probably a minority as Christians wanting to know God wanting to walk in God's holiness and if it were not for the fact that Jesus died for us we'd be doomed to continue in our sin we'd still be slaves to our sin not just the penalty of our sin but its power as well so, he came, he gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, and whose will was this? According to that verse, verse 4. According to... Right. According to the will of our God and Father. Which means it's this. It, it's, it's, uh, it was God's idea. It's God's plan. It's God's purpose. Jesus came. He laid his life. He lived among us, right, without sin. He gave himself for us and for, the, for our sin. And because we're sinners, he gave himself for us. And it was the will of God. This wasn't a plan hatched by an institution, you know, an early organization that we now call the church. And, hey, you know what we need to do? We need to come up with a plan. No, it wasn't the Pharisees' plan. It wasn't the committees. The, hmm? the committees. Yeah, it wasn't the committee plan. No, no. It was the will or the plan. It was the purpose of the Father who sent Jesus. And Jesus who willingly and, and, and deliberately came for us and laid his life down for us so that we could be set free. Delivered means to be set free, right? To be set free from the present evil age. According to the will of our God and Father. <coughs> Alright, in verse 5, how does that end? To whom be the glory forever. Right. To whom? The Father. The what? The glory. The glory. So it's not man's plan, as we as we've already discussed. It's not Paul's plan. It's not Paul who should get credit here. It's not uh, the, the apostles who should get credit here. It's certainly not the council, the Pharisees and the Sadducees who should get credit here. It's not even the Jews who should get credit here. It's not Rome who should get credit here. It's not anybody except whom? God. 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 That's right. God should get the credit here. Understand this. In other words, when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to them, understand this. That there, there's, there, there's this wonderful thing that Jesus has done for you. And he did it because God loves you. And God's will here, it's not reactionary. God's not coming up with plan B, plan C, and plan D because everyone's messing up the earlier plans. God's on track with what he intended from the beginning of time. Oh, okay, so in verse 6 through verse 10. But somebody would like to read that. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ 
and they're turning to a different gospel. Not that there is any, any um, another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. Okay. So he basically starts this. After he, inter he does through the introduction, and he's, he, he lays before them the foundation uh, of what he's going to address as he writes this letter to them. He says, I'm, I'm astonished. I'm surprised. I'm shocked. The word astonished is a strong word. You know, we don't run around using the word a whole lot. Astonished, I was astonished. We might say something like that. But usually what we'll say was, I was absolutely shocked. I couldn't believe what I heard. And why? What is it that's going on that has him going... What is it? They're listening to someone who's warping the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, he, they're, they're, he's basically saying, hey guys, you have abandoned it. You've abandoned the gospel. You, you are deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ. You've turned to a different gospel. Another message, right? Now, the next thing he says is very important for us to pay attention to because there is even among some Christians this idea that um, other beliefs are equal you know you can believe what you want and I can believe what I want and we're all good right well that's that might be true of all you want is a little bit of social acceptance and and you're you, you don't like conflict and and uh, you just don't want trouble right but when it comes down to a life-saving thing that's not acceptable is it they were given life, but now they're choosing something that was promised to them as life, but isn't. What do we call something that claims to be one thing, but is in fact another? When we have money that's printed, there's a certain way that it has to be presented and, pr and produced, right? If that money that you hold isn't produced in that way, what do we call that? Counterfeit. We call it counterfeit. It's fake. It's trying to pass itself off as legitimate, but is empty of value. Isn't that what counterfeit money is? Mm -hmm. So is counterfeit, counterfeit faith. So they, he's astonished because they have forsaken or deserted him who called them in the grace of Christ, and they've turned to a different gospel. In verse 7, what does he say? Not that there is another gospel. There's not another gospel. What does gospel mean? Good news. Good news. It means good news. Gospel translates as good news. There isn't another good news because anything else is either utterly false or bad news. And you will see as we go through this why what they have heard is gospel is in fact very bad news indeed. Okay, in verse 7 he says, Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Okay, so what he's saying is that there are people in their midst, right, who want, they have an agenda. They want to trouble you. Doesn't that smack of somebody have an agenda of malice? Or a, an agenda of selfishness? The idea that they want to cause trouble for someone suggests, I think, very strongly that there's some, there are just some people who like to make trouble. They want to cause conflict. They enjoy it. Are there situations where people today just, they just like trouble? It's entertaining for them. Or maybe it's a way to divert responsibility. Maybe there's something wrong in their lives and, and, and they don't want to deal with it. What's the quickest way to get people to leave them alone. Point at somebody else. To point at someone else. Right? Redirect others. Oh, yeah, but what about him? Yeah. What about them? What about her? What about those guys over there? <coughs> if we get people talking about all of those people, 
or that person or that thing over there, then they're not paying attention to me. And especially if I can make them think that there's something else going on over there that uh, somehow fits an agenda that I may have. Maybe somehow I can obtain, what are some things that people uh, use trouble and cause hurt trouble for uh, that uh, make that benefits them? Money is one thing. What Are there other reasons? Financial gain, of course. You know, I can deceive someone. I'll, you know, if I can convince somebody that there's going to be some kind of trouble with this over here, maybe I can give them some kind of deal on some kind of insurance against it and you know they'll pay me for it and I make money off of their fear and, and for power for power so money financial gain power so whatever the reason they're doing it though whatever the reason that motivates them to cause trouble it boils down to this they distort the gospel what does it mean to distort Change, lie. change, or lie. lie, or twist, or bend in some way, right? So that it isn't really the way it's supposed to be. They distort it. Um, you've seen, I don't know if you've been in one, but you've been, anyone ever been in a fun house with mirrors that made you look weird and that kind of thing? Even if you haven't, you know what it is because you probably seen some reference to it in TV or something, right? You can do it on your phone now. You can do it on your, yeah, you know what, that's a good, <laughs> yeah, these filters, you know, it's interesting what you can do with filters, you can, you can, um, I'm not familiar with the app, <coughs> Snapchat one of them, Snapchat one, yeah, where it can make, a, you can have a group of people and they can twist their face all up where they look either really angry or sour, or give them a puppy face or whatever, what does that do? But it distorts their, their, their uh, image, doesn't it? So, Paul's saying, and they didn't have filters like that, you know, on phones, but they did have filters in the sense that there were ideas. That if you look at life through those ideas, those perspectives, it twisted the, the reality. So, you, you, hey guys, Galatia, you know, you had the gospel, but now here's something that's twisting your perspective, twisting the way you see things, the way you see God, the way, the way you see yourselves, the way you see the world, the way you see others, it's the, the way you see it, uh, how you should live life. It's twisting the gospel. He doesn't allude yet quite to what that is, but he's laying it out there right off the bat, isn't he? He's not, he's not mincing words about what's going on. You're believing something that's wrong. And it's dangerous. It's poisonous. And the problem with it is, is that it's like that. Uh, it's like that desensitizing that I mentioned earlier. You don't. You're accepting as real something that is not. Verse eight. He says, "But listen, guys. If I or the guys with me, the apostles, if even us, even us." Or an angel who claimed to be from God came to you in all the power that an angel might come, or with all the credentials that we as apostles might have, came to you to give you a substitute or a counterfeit story of how you can be saved, or how to walk with God, and how you should live life, and what is truth, and so on. What does he say about them? What does he say about those imposters? Need to be accursed. Let them be accursed. And what does that mean? That's pretty heavy. Let them be judged. Let them be revealed for the lies that they are. And it's so, and he, he's, he's so emphatic about this because he knows what's at stake. What is at stake? Why does this matter? Is this, is he just, uh, just being fussy? Salvation people's souls. souls. Their salvation is at stake, isn't it? Because if they believe that there's another way to God but, but through Jesus, what, what do they lose out on? Salvation. The real way to have salvation. The real, real way to know God. And it's life and death. And not just physical life, it's eternal life and death. 
Those are, those are the highest stakes that we can imagine. Let them be a curse. Let them be judged. Let them be known for what they are. Let them be revealed as the lies that they are. Verse 9, he says, I'm going to say that again because it's so important. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you receive, which is what? That Jesus died on the cross from you, that it, that, that it is through faith in him, and only faith in him that saves you. If someone has preached to you anything but that, what? Let them be accursed. Because this is important. In verse 10, he, you know, he, 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 he could be, like many of us might be in a situation like this, well, I don't want to use too strong a language. I don't want to come on too strong about this. You know, but this isn't just politics. This isn't just about the differences of opinion, you know, opinion on economics and things like that. This isn't about lifestyle. It's not about culture. It's about their souls. Verse 10, it's such a big deal that I, I can't afford to play around with this. Am I seeking the approval, verse 10, of man or God? Am I trying to please man? No. Try to please God. No. He says, I, I'm, I'm here to serve Jesus. Jesus is the reason I'm here. Jesus is the reason I'm writing to you, Galatia. He's the reason. So I can't play games. I'm not going to mince words. I'm going to tell you like this. You need Jesus. You need to get back on track with what it means to be saved. And it's not just because he's worried about the people. He's not talking about people losing salvation. What he's talking about is the power of the message that they have. If they lose sight of that, they stop preaching the gospel. If they stop preaching the gospel, the people stop hearing the gospel. And if people stop hearing the gospel, what do they lose? But the opportunity to respond to the gospel. And that goes back to what we talked about earlier, isn't it? It's life and death. It's eternal life and death. Bless you. Let me read a little bit here. In verse 11 he says, For I would have you know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. To say, what he's saying is, it's, it's, this, is this is not something I made up. This was given to me. Verse 12, I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. And he was, he was a person who was taught, like we said earlier. He was a student. He, knew, he was a student of the law. He knew the covenants of God from the Old Testament. But the, now, now there's Jesus, right? And he has met Jesus. It has come from Jesus, what he has preached to them. And it is only that message that can save them. <laughs> For you have heard in my former life, in verse 13, in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age, among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. You understand what he's talking about here? He's talking about how this isn't, I don't, I'm not preaching this to you because it was preached to me. Why, what, what is it that he's preaching to them, but what Jesus himself has given to them? And I think that one of the takeaways for us today is how important it is for us to own our own salvation. What I mean is, we can grow up in a religious family. We can grow up in the church. We can have been taught all the Sunday school curriculums we've ever had, and no catechisms, and so forth and so on. But if we've not personally responded to Jesus and the gospel and, and, and allowed the gospel of Jesus to change us individually, me, then I'm still as lost as I ever was. And whatever message I might have falls short of the gospel of Jesus. So you hear what I'm saying, right? You need to be able to look back at your life and reflect on that moment or that occasion when you, when you believe, not because you were taught it by mom or dad or grandma or aunts or uncles or even by a Sunday school teacher or by a preacher, but because you realize from Jesus that this is Jesus and I need to receive him myself as Lord and Savior and, and trust him. I hope that makes sense. Because it's still as high a stakes a game as it ever was. It's your eternal life. 
He goes on to say, when, um, verse 15, but when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me. Who's he talking about? When I, one who called me, who was the one who called him? The Father. God the Father, right? He revealed his son, Jesus, to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone, meaning he didn't go and get permission from anybody. What did he do? Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. When he says Arabia there, he means, he doesn't mean like any far Saudi Arabia. He means the general area near Damascus, actually. After three years, as he's just processing what God has done in his life, I went to Jerusalem to visit Cephas. Who's Cephas? Peter, right? And remained with him 15 days, and I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, and, and what I'm writing to you, he says parenthetically, uh, before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now, what's he doing? What's he, as, he, as he writes about all the places that he goes, what's he doing? According to verse... 23. He's preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And then verse 24, it tells us what the conclusion of that is. What is the outcome of the fact that those who, and, and you know, you wonder why. Why did God let Saul persecute all these believers? So he could use him. So he could use him. And so I think and in, 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 in line with what you just said, Robin, I think so he could show, God could show through Paul the contrast of a life that thought he was following God and a life that really was following God. Yeah. And then he could forgive him for it. That's right, exactly right. And God could forgive even, even Paul. Even somebody, you know, going against him, going against God. Yeah, because that would have been probably in the minds of those people, pretty serious, right? Oh, yeah. He was trying to kill yeah, people who follow sin. Jesus. That seems like a big kind of sin to me. Big sin. And yet here he's preaching Jesus. So that means what you just said, God must have forgiven him. God can forgive yeah. a murderer. Yeah. God can forgive a, a, a blasphemer. <coughs> but that's what he was. He didn't realize it. He thought he was doing good. But he was a blasphemer because he was working and living and preaching against truth of Jesus. As long as you ask for forgiveness you can have it. And God forgave him. And God used him. And then because God was using him in verse 24, they glorified God because of him. And what does that do to the message of the gospel? It makes it stronger. They can, they can see the impact of the gospel. If the gospel can do that for Paul, mm -hmm. then the gospel can do that for me. Make a jerk as I can be. God can forgive me. It makes it more real. Yeah. Okay. Any takeaways? That God can forgive us of anything. That God can forgive us of anything. That's right. Any other takeaways? And that God really loved us to give up his son. Yes. Because Paul, that's what he's preaching. Isn't yeah. It? And that's what he's trying to remind them of that God gave his son. For I mean, it's you. just don't mind. mess this up, guys. Don't mess this up. That's just mind blowing. <laughs> really. In this day and time to think. It's still mind blowing. Yeah. It is. Okay, we'll conclude with that. Do you have anything you want to share? Kind of out of the outflow of what we read here. Is this a letter that's as much true today and as much needed as ever? If, if we were in Paul's place, what would we write? I fear I wouldn't write enough. Be in trouble with it. Yeah. Wouldn't be that eloquent. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if eloquent is actually the word Paul well, is going for here. I think the, blunt. I mean, I'm just saying... <laughs> You knuckleheads, what are you doing? Well, he said it in a, kind of a nice way. Yeah. 
trying to say it in a nice way, I guess. <laughs> and he's, he's writing to people, and here's another reason that I think he takes this tone, because the tone he takes when he writes, when he, when he speaks to people who don't know God's grace, he is tactful. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he knows his crowd, so to speak, but he writes here to people who should know better. Yeah. They should know better. And so he's writing to them on a level they should be at, but even though they're sliding here. He's not writing to babies. Right. He's writing to people who've heard the truth. They've been changed by the truth, and yet now they're, they're wandering from the truth. He said, he get back to... where you belong. Get back now. Well, he's also, I think, still trying to show them that God truly changed him from what he used to be. Yeah. Now he's I'm kinder, sure that's true, he's more I'm mellow. Sure that's true. Yeah. yeah, he's kinder, more mellow. This is some of the strongest language he uses in his letters, though. Mm -hmm. So he's he's being tough. Oh yeah, so. got to be sometimes. All right. Well, would somebody like to close us in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the time we had to spend in your house, God. Thank you for all that you do for us, God. Thanks that we don't even recognize. Thank you for Tom being here to uh, lead us uh, in our uh, mission this evening to explain things to us. God, help us to take it to heart and learn it and understand it and apply it to our lives. Now, God, go with us and watch over us. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you all. You guys, thank you, too, for being prepared. I have not made it back. I really appreciate it. And for praying for the baby and, and for Kayla. praying for the baby and Kayla. Well, in the company. It's like my phone went off. We might just be doing audio. <laughs> uh -oh. It says I've heard so much.